Our scripture today is Job 2, 1 through 10. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the soles of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this Job did not sin with his lips. If you'll pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this time, a time to just set aside in the middle of our week and just focus on you. Lord, center our hearts on who you are. God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy towards us, Lord, for you are maker of heaven and earth. You are over all things and have authority over all things. And God, we thank you that you humbled yourself in the form of man and sent Jesus to just be one with our suffering, to understand what it is to live a life on this earth and yet still remain sinless. God, we just pray over Carly in this time that you would give her your strength, that she would just proclaim your truths, and God, that we would have ears and hearts to receive it today. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Laura. Well, hello. As I mentioned before, my name is Carly Butler. I'm the pastor of worship and mission here, and so I'm not typically up here during this segment. I'm usually sitting over there. So this is very new for me. I'm excited but very nervous to be up here, so I hope that you will um, just bear with me as we um, dig into the Word of God together. It's my hope today that this message, through this message, we will ponder, wonder, marvel, and wrestle with God together. Um, So without further ado, here we go. Uh, Before we begin digging into Job, I thought that it was appropriate for me to share some of my own story. Um, So I call this the Carly Chronicles, um, just for fun. So stage one was early childhood, and so I grew up in the church, and my parents had me there pretty much every time the doors were open, and at that point in my life, I believed everything that the adults in my life were telling me, and so it wasn't difficult for me to accept God. Um, I was a rule follower, and so I think this played a lot into my early understanding of God, and I believed what the adults, again, were telling me in my life. So fast forward a few years into my youth group era, and I began to understand that this wasn't just a concrete understanding of Jesus. It meant having a relationship with Jesus, and I grew and deepened in those understandings. However, at this point in my life, I didn't have a lot of circumstances to really challenge this view that I had of God, and so it wasn't until stage three, my college years, that I really began um, encountering new challenges to my faith and really wondering what this was that I was doing and um, taking it as my own. So... I got married right after college and then life transitioned yet again into what I call stage four, the young adult era. Um, It was during this time um, in my early 20s that I spent uh, in a lot of turmoil as I really didn't know what I was going to do career-wise and all of the things that come along with being a young young adult and trying to figure out life. And um, so I really, uh, I really just wrestled a lot. And it was, 
uh, during this time, I felt very restless and aimless and honestly depressed a lot of days. Um, this was a time when I encountered God in a different way than I ever had before, which was out of desperation. So during that time, I was able to find some Jesus followers who helped sharpen and hone my faith into something deeper and more grounded than ever before. Um, I began to learn more about the spirit, different types of prayer, uh, fasting, silence and solitude, practices that we sometimes talk about in here. And this really served to challenge and deepen my spiritual roots. I also saw people encounter the Father, Jesus, and the Spirit differently than I ever had before. And it caused me to wonder what there was more for me to learn about this thing that I had been following for a long time. It was during this time I had a massive growth spurt and equipping. Um, and I deepened, and I grew, and I learned, and I leaned in, and I wanted to be all in. And that's when my world fell apart. Um, my dad, a man I very much credit for providing a massive, a massive example of faith, grace, love, encouragement, received an irreversible diagnosis, something I'm not really fully sh ready to share about. And um, he passed away two years later. <sighs> this is harder than I thought it would be. <laughs> Um, I walked through, and I'm still in a lot of ways, walking through a heart-wrenching Job season. I had a lot of questions, a lot of doubts, a lot of tears, a lot of wrestling matches with God. I laid prostrate on the ground praying to him over and over again to take it all away. I was filled with constant sorrow. I was angry and I was in the longest suffering season that I had ever endured in my life. Every day I wondered if it was worth it. And in all of this, an inner spiritual strength pulled me through the depths of despair. The whisper of truth from that period of equipping called out to me in the darkness. My faith muscle had to flex hard. And to be honest, it still does a lot of days. I knew what I had witnessed in the faith of others, my dad included, and I stood on their foundations for a lot of days. Why would a good God allow such a horrible thing to happen? Why did it rip my family apart? Why me? Why now? Aren't I too young for something like this? It was from this place I learned a hard lesson. No one escapes Job seasons. Pain, suffering, sorrow, grief, it will strike. And in the midst of it, how do we pull through with our faith still intact? How do we worship God in the midst of suffering? It's from this place that I bring you this message today. <laughs> A little sip of water there. All right. So if you'll open your Bibles or your apps or whatever to the book of Job, we're going to be doing a really big bird's eye view. Up on the screen, you'll see a structure that I think is helpful as we dig into 42 verses of scripture in just the short time that we have together. Um, so let me begin by saying that as we launch into this book, several things arise in me and maybe in you as well. Job's story is uncomfortable, to say the least, because we're onlookers to a journey of a man who is righteous, has everything the world has to offer, and then he loses it. Not only does he lose it, but it's taken from him by the enemy. There's discord in our hearts and minds as we consider this pain, and we wonder what it might mean for us. It begs a question that's pained humankind throughout history. Why does God allow suffering, pain, loss, grief. I'm sorry to tell you that I'm not up here to give you clear answers to that today, and I honestly don't know fully the answers to those questions. Complex questions require complex answers, and even then, our answers fall short. As you'll see in one man's journey of suffering, I believe much of our struggle comes from a limited human un attempt to understand a complex, limitless God. 
Today, we'll take a bird's eye view of the story of Job and his pilgrimage with suffering and joy, pain and blessing, and attempts to glean some wisdom about worship in the midst of suffering. So if you look, something we notice early on in the book of Job in the first couple of chapters is that God seems to point out to Satan that Job is a righteous servant and allows Satan the power to take away his earthly treasures, his children, and then finally his health. This tells us that Satan still has some dominion over the earth, which is scary, right? It doesn't take a genius to look around the world and see that we live in a very broken, dark world. This is because we still have a very real enemy that has some power over the earth. Ephesians 6.12 tells us, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. We know through scripture that this, that ultimate power and authority still lies with God. And as we can see in verse 12, as Satan asks permission from God to test Job. So why does God allow Satan this dominion? Thanks for asking. I don't know. (laughs) Here's what I do know. From the moment sin entered the world through Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, humanity's connection with God was severed. And we entered into a fallen state. And living eternally in that fallen state was not something that God had intended for us. And so out of love, he cast us out of the garden so that we would have a way to come into right relationship with him again before we entered back into that eternal state. Thus, we live in a fallen and a broken world, the result of that severed relationship. I also know that in James 1, verses 12 through 15, it says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. As I mentioned earlier, we are limited humans trying to understand a limitless God. His holiness, his goodness... They're far greater than we could ever imagine or know. This is why we see so many rules and regulations surrounding the presence of God in the Old Testament and the removal of sin and so many things about purification because God's presence is so good and so pure that we in our fallen state cannot enter into it without something there before us. The third thing I know is that God's redemptive nature is, shows up time and time again throughout all of Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament alike, we see this characteristic of God, and he is making all things new, and we are invited into this process through Christ. We hold on to the tension that while things are presently not all right, they will be one day. It's with these things in mind that we return to the story of Job, who, if you'll remember at this point, has lost everything, barring his health. So we see Job tear his robes and shave his head, which is the posture of grieving. And if you look at chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then the author notes that in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. It is here that Satan approaches God again, certain that if Job loses his health, he will curse God. So the Lord gives permission for Satan to take this as well. The one thing he has left is his life and his wife and his friends. So this is the statement that we get after Job's losses. Chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, Then his wife said to him, as we read earlier, Do you hold fast your integrity, curse God, and die? We see from her statement that she is asking Job to do exactly what Satan says he will. But this is Job's response. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? The author for the second time lets us know that in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. At this point, we've been told twice that Job has not 
sinned or charged God with wrong in the midst of his circumstances. And we get the first glimpse of what it looks like to worship in the middle of suffering. Job does not do as Satan suggests he will and renounce God once he has lost everything, even when his wife encourages him to do so. Instead, Job acknowledges and reminds himself that God is good and he has good things to give us in the midst of his grief. You see, worship is a turning toward God, regardless of our circumstances. Lament or taking our griefs to God is not a sin. The sin is when we try to judge for ourselves what is good and bad and understand things that only God can understand, putting ourselves in the place of God. Worship is the opposite. When we turn toward God and align ourselves with him, putting him in the rightful place of our lives. Continuing in chapter 2, verse 11, we see Job's friends take a stab at comforting and relating to Job. Um, Enter Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. They are awesome. So uh, (laughs) here we see in verse 11, they made an appointment together to come show him, Job, sympathy and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. Here we see the friends grieving with Job, and this seven days and seven nights was a complete mourning time in this point in history. So we see that they enter in, and they mourn with him, and they grieve with him. However, it seems that during all of that silence, they've been doing some thinking of their own, And next we get this series of conversations between Job and his friends where they try to come up with reasons why Job might be suffering in this state. This is where it all hits the fan. Um, it's, It's clear that at some point their intentions for sympathy, empathy, and comfort have turned to judgment, harsh criticisms, and trying to understand for themselves. So each friend takes it in turn to speak ill will over their friend. So Zophar is the first friend. His tactic is to point out that as a sinner, Job actually deserves even worse. So comforting, right? (laughs) (laughs) Eliphaz takes a slightly different approach and accuses Job of not fearing God enough. Just what everyone wants to hear in the pit of despair, right? Eliphaz makes a common mistake in assuming that God allows suffering for the unrighteous and blessing to the righteous. He splits it in too simplistic of a nature. Next comes Bildad, who asserts that Job must have done something wicked that he doesn't even remember because God punishes the wicked. Each of the friend's interpretations of Job's circumstances are yet again limited humans trying to understand a limitless God, to know for themselves whether Job has been good or bad and whether he deserves this kind of suffering. While it's true that God is a just God, suffering does not always equate to direct punishment from him. Once again, there are complex answers to complex questions. If suffering were just meant to be punishment for the wicked, then why would Hebrews 2.10 say, for it was fitting that he, Jesus, for whom all things exist, and bringing many sons and daughters to glory, should make the founder of their salvation, Jesus, perfect through suffering. If God suffers, and we know that he is perfect, then it can't simply be that suffering is for the wicked. Now, aside from the hypocrisy of judging their friend's actions, this is just a a terrible way to comfort your friend. (laughs) I have found it to be true in life that you are either going through a Job season or you are the friend of someone going through a Job season. If we have not stopped to consider our own frailty and propensity for suffering and pain, we often speak recklessly. Instead of comforting those who mourn, we have the ability to cause more pain to that person rather than ease it or simply bear it with them. We often speak from a place of selfish fear instead of selfless love. 
to silence the pain of our own vulnerabilities, we often place quick band-aids quick band on gaping wounds. Tell me if this sounds familiar. It will be okay. At least you still have fill in the blank. Have you prayed about it? Or the worst of these, in my opinion, is meeting you with silence when you have chosen to share something raw or vulnerable. In my own story, I can tell you that these Band-Aids were often offered to me, and I wanted nothing to do with them. Complex issues met with simpli simplistic answers or comfort or trite phrases, they can cause deeper pain to those who are already suffering. I can also tell you that I had friends that were able to weep with me, comfort me, sit with me, but these were rare, too rare. Here are things that actually brought me comfort. Acknowledging that the words that you give can do nothing to ease the pain because we don't have that kind of power over others. I don't think we actually want that kind of power when we really think about what that would mean. Having basic needs met without asking, things like gift cards, meals, cleaning your house, etc. Because when someone is grieving and you ask them what they need, it can often feel so much more taxing. They don't know what they need. They're going through the unimaginable. Tell them you see them. Show them you see them. Because we desire connection in our pain, connection with those around us, love and compassion for those, from those who are meant to love us best, family, friends, spouses. Don't be like Job's friends. Don't pretend to know the things of God. Don't band-aid answers to open wounds that need far greater care. Instead, ask the Spirit for discernment and gentleness, a gift from the Spirit as you approach your friends in their Job season. Pain can sharpen and hone us into a beautiful jewel, shining bright and forged through fire, or as John Mark Comer likes to put it, into a person of love. But it can also intimidate us and scare us into silence or turning away from God. But there is no greater strength, humility, growth, rootedness that takes place in a person when in the depths of suffering and grief and despair, they can still find the strength and the courage to turn to God to somehow find a piece of them that still believes that he is still good, still merciful, still holy. I mentioned earlier that something that helped me to do this was through the faith and belief of others. Worship is our weapon against the darkness. Our most powerful incentive to do what is right, to be merciful, to walk in a life of humility as we talked about last week in Micah 6, 8. To do this, we must turn toward God and align ourselves with him. Allowing his overflow to seep into our very being. Now Job responds to each of his friends in all of this with a defense of his own character, stating that he is generous. He has done nothing but try to provide generously for his household. He has abstained from lust and adultery. He has tried his best to live righteously under what God had for him. But they weren't there to listen. So Job, at the end, if you fast forward to chapter 31, he wishes for God to answer him so that he may give an account for all of his steps. And that's the last we hear from Job until he finally gets his wish. Okay, so I have to pause here in our story and acknowledge Elihu, uh, which is another friend that up until this point is not really mentioned at all. And by not really, he isn't. He isn't mentioned at all until this point. And he seems to appear out of nowhere and then disappear out of nowhere. Because after he speaks, the story no longer acknowledges that he's there. Um, he, his dialogue also differs from the rest of Job because it's told in sort of a narrative form instead of a dialogue between Job and his friends. Um, and so there's a lot of split debate on why he is there, whether what he is saying is good, whether it's bad. And so um, there are some that fall into this camp that they think that what he has to say is great and Job meets it with silence because he finally believes what Elihu has to say. There are others 
myself included, who think that he is coming from a place of arrogance and yet again meeting his friend who is desperate with trite answers. So whether or not he's right or wrong, I mean, there you go, clear as mud. Um, <laughs> I think we can safely say that we are still operating from a limited perspective for the understanding the things of God. Still debating these things. So we're going to return to our story. At this point in the story, we've gotten 38 chapters in without God speaking directly to Job. This type of silence from God can feel extremely frustrating and disheartening when in the midst of suffering, to say the least. Those are not words that actually encompass all of that you feel. But uh, it is from this place that we hear many people cry out to God through scripture. It's written this way all over the Psalms. Again, that lament piece that I was mentioning earlier. But I do think that this is even more reason why we need to learn to be better friends to those going through a painful season. So that when you don't hear from God, you can be strengthened by the spirit of those around you. Okay, let's jump in. Here comes God. <laughs> God is going to appear out of a whirlwind, which storm imagery is often used to in a wide variety of scenarios in the Old Testament to describe how God appears to his people. Here, I think we can acknowledge that the whirlwind, the storm, the tempest imagery allows us to know the power and the might that he is showing up in full force in front of Job. So chapter 38, when you look, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. He goes on to speak several chapters like this over Job, just again and again, pointing Job to the point that God is in control of every little thing that happens on the earth, including when the lions get fed and the goats um, need milk from their mothers. So it's very powerful. Unfortunately, we don't have time to read all of that today. I really wish we did, but please go back and read it. It's, it's terrifying and beautiful and all the things that I think are true about God. <laughs> so in chapter 42, we get Job's response to all of this. He says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So after receiving a full explanation from God himself about the expanse of his power and his omniscience over all of creation, Job is humbled to the point of repentance. He turns toward God and has a new understanding for his humble place in the full story of God. It's here that we can once again learn from Job's posture and respect toward his creator. We too can acknowledge our limitations, our lack of seeing the full picture, repenting when we've tried to control our fates. And we can turn toward God with the recognition of who he is. This is true worship. The book of Job closes as God rebukes the friends each in turn, and then we get this really small epilogue where all of Job's fortunes are restored to him twofold. Worth it. <laughs> it still feels uncomfortable, doesn't it? We're left with some answers, but we're also left with so many questions. As I invite the band back up, I invite you to consider this. When faced with your Job season, you have a choice. 
You can walk away from it all, trying to make do with your own understanding, or you can press into who God is. You can hold the tension of recognizing the brokenness and heartbreak that surrounds us and also remember that God is the creator of the universe and we are but a thread in the redemptive fabric of all of the priesthood of believers woven together throughout all of time. And you're in good company. That kind of worship will turn us into a beautiful person who, like Job, can stand strong, full of integrity, wisdom, love, compassion, and humility, able to love our friends and neighbors all the more. Let's stand in song together. Hey, thanks for watching the service. We pray that it blessed you and helped you grow closer to God. If you are in the Nashville area, we'd love for you to join us sometime. If you're not in the Nashville area, we'd love to help you get connected with the local church if you don't already have one. We pray that God blesses you this week and that he grows you closer in your relationship with him and with your community, that he uses you in a powerful way to be a vessel of his good news in everywhere that you go. May God bless you.